We're stepping into the second week of my Lenten series. For some reason, we couldn't go over the first one. I think it had something to do with a little flood in the church. In my article uh, that I put in the e-link this last week, I tried my best to synopsize what the first week was about. If you've had a chance to read that, great. If not, I'll try to even condense it a little further as we enter into our second week of our series of Wilderness Steps with Jesus. It is based on the writings of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, which read, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, whom you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to the Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. That is the background of our series. The complementary and supplemental text that goes with today is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made more visible in our mortal flesh. May God add a blessing on the reading of his words today. In these 40 days of Lent, we take steps in the wilderness with Jesus. This time comes after his baptism, which is an outward and visible sign for all the world to see that Jesus has given himself in totality to God. Immediately following, Jesus is taken out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit with no provisions or preparations and is tempted by the Satan. A lot of people say Satan. That is grammatically incorrect. Satan means the adversary, the recognized enemy of God. That is not a name, that is a title. So forgive me, I will say the in front of it. That's just how I interpret it. Each wilderness experience that comes presents a time of difficulties and struggles for Jesus, just like it does for ourselves. Mark says that there were wild beasts in the wilderness with Jesus. When we find ourselves experiencing wilderness times, do do they not come with their own wild beasts? Creatures or peoples or ideas or feelings which seek to consume and destroy us so they can survive or be uplifted and we die a little bit and shrink? Fear is always crouching in the shrubbery nearby. Not just or just around the next corner or lurking in the shadows. It is ever ready to pounce and strangle the very life, the very joy out of us. Temptation within this slithers all around us, waiting for the opportunity to strike. Despair circles like vultures overhead, waiting to land and devour what is left is too weak to defend itself against other attackers. I believe that when we have our wilderness times, there are wild beasts that are there to encroach and challenge us. There are temptations in our places where we are at our weakest. These are times that challenge our faith in who we will trust, our values as to what we believe is important, Specifically, our trust in God who created the heavens and the earth and what we believe about his presence, his promise, 
and His saving grace in our lives. All of these and more are challenges we face when we are in the wilderness. We call this type of challenging temptation. And when we face temptation head-on instead of giving into it, we receive a clarity of God's all-powerful love, all-powerful providence, all-powerful protection, and his all-powerful purpose for each and every one of us. I remember when I turned 40, just a few years ago, um, a friend of mine sent me a card that said, as you grow older, don't worry about avoiding temptations. They're going to avoid you. You want to know something? Oh, how I wish that were true. <laughs> as I grow older, I have come to discover that I will never really grow out of being tempted. But the day will come when my body will be unable to act upon them. But even if my body cannot give in to temptation, my mind, as long as it stays intact, always will. We never outgrow the ever-present, the ever-moving, the all-powerfulness of temptation. The Franciscan friar Anthony of Padua spoke the truth when he said, Expect temptation with your last breath. Temptation is the very real part of life, and it is especially challenging when we are in wilderness times. Those times of spiritual dryness, loneliness, despair, fear, disappointment, low self-esteem, and bitterness. In those times, we are more susceptible to the power of temptation, and each temptation in the wilderness presents us with a corresponding challenge. In the wilderness, the temptation is to stray or abandon the values we hold dear. Our challenge, then, is to hold fast to them and live by them despite the difficulty. In the wilderness, the temptation is to take shortcuts, avoid struggle, to find the easy way through, or, and our challenge within that is to move through the struggles into the long, hard way. Because in that long, hard way, we tend to learn more, and we come out better. When it comes to dealing with temptation, according to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it reads, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. The right way, the way we have and we are to experience is fulfilled. To have a fulfilled spiritual life is often a hard and narrow path. The challenge is to preserve what values and move through this struggle, acknowledging and enduring this difficulty of the task, but relying upon God's presence to uphold us and take us through every step and every breath of the challenges we face. In the wilderness, there is a temptation to listen to the voices that would lead us away from God. The challenge for us is to listen to our living and life-giving God. Our world fills us with thousands of voices representing many diverse understandings and definitions of what is ultimately important to survive a principled and purposeful life. Through radio, television, internet programs, conversations with our friends and those that we seek counsel from, we can fill our ears and our minds with so much data that making a decision as to what is important, our values, or, under, or the things that we should understand clearly can be increasingly difficult. Instead of values and truth that we hold, we tend to have opinions and prejudices. When I was in seminary, every professor I had a class with said, to be a good pastor, you must master what I teach. Here's the rub. I had 20 different professors in my three and a half years of seminary who specialized in 20 different 
disciplines of spiritual service. And I had to master all of them to be a good pastor while they went and got their PhDs and specialized in only one. I found their claim to be a bit confusing, overwhelming, and on their part, a little overreaching. With all the noise and the many voices, it is increasingly difficult to discern the good, that which is sent from God, from the evil, that which is sent by the Satan. More often than not, the evil tempts us and leads us into giving our allegiance to something or someone other than God. And this is a portrayal as, uh, with an, uh, you know, usually we portray this with an ugly and scary voice. But in reality, the evil that presents itself in our lives doesn't come with pointy tails, horns, cloven hooves, or a menacing scowl. That is a rather repulsive image, and we would naturally run away from it. In the reality of the world that we live in, evil presents itself as something good and something easy. This seduction takes something that is evil and destructive and presents it as something that promises something wonderful and glorious benefits without any work, without any struggle, without any effort on our parts. See the latest commercials for take this pill and you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days? I don't believe it. Money, power, influence, weight loss plans, self-help, sex, beauty, a long, healthy life, personal security, coming out on top, fame, all of them can be good, yet evil can twist them all into something that is destructive, perverted, and gives us no joy, no satisfaction. No peace. For it calls us to sacrifice the integrity of our souls to satisfy the machinations of our egos. In the wilderness, there is the temptation to substitute stuff in the place of God to make us feel better. The challenge for us is to live knowing that that which God provides us is sufficient for a happy, healthy, wholesome life. One of the great temptations that we face is the temptation to always have more. But happiness is just around the corner if you just have that latest iPhone, that newest iPad, that newer and better computer, that bigger house, that more efficient heating system, that bright, spriny, bright shiny car that just won the J.D. Power Awards in the foreign market. I think it was put out by Buick, if I understand the report correctly. All we need to do is have this stuff to have more wealth, to have finer things of life, more activity, so we don't have to stop, be at peace, and face the struggles within the depths of our mind, body, and spirits. In the wilderness, the temptation is to give up, quit when life gets hard, surrender because we don't have the will, and our challenge is to persevere to endure. The life-giving way is to rise up. And when I mean life-giving, I mean eternal life-giving, the life with Jesus, with our Lord, to rise up and meet the challenges head-on and persevere in doing what is right. In this case, being faithful to God by turning to God, listening to God. Trusting God and following God. We cannot genuinely expect to love others as God loves us until we start having a life of trusting God first. Now the good news in all of this is that God is there to strengthen us, to take care of us, to provide for us, be present with us, so that we can meet those challenges of temptation. Paul wrote of his own personal experience in 2 Corinthians. And in chapters 4 and verses 8 and 9, I highlight some of his words of celebration. We are afflicted in every way. 
The world drops whatever it can drop on us from any angle that we can perceive or not even come close to imagining. It is the things that take us by surprise and go, wow, where did that come from? But we are not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. In other words, we are pressed on every side by troubles, and they do, not tr- they do not crush or break us. We are overwhelmed and con- confused by all the stimuli that is around us, but we know why things, ha- you know, understand in detail why things happen the way we do. But when we don't, we don't give up or quit. We may be hunted down, but in all of this, our God never abandons us. Perseverance, endurance, is so often the key to meet the challenges of the wilderness. And this perseverance with God is what gives us our clarity. It shows us the way. It shows us the truth. It shows us the life we can have with Jesus. Meeting the challenge of the wilderness each time helps us to prepare for meeting the challenge of the next time because challenges will not stop. Temptations will not stop. Evil will not stop. Never will our God. We will struggle with our temptations of the wilderness and out of that struggle will come a character of seeing a character of understanding, and a character of of accepting the truth of an ever-loving, ever-present, ever-graceful Heavenly Father. James writes in his book in chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, he tells his readers, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Seriously, I was to be joyful when we discovered the flood in the building. Yes. Sounds a little far-fetched. Hang with me for a minute. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurances have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. By lacking in nothing, we're talking about not lacking in understanding the powerful, graceful presence of God in our lives. I'm very thankful for our duct system because it saved our building. And I was able to kind of laugh about all of it. People would ask me questions. How are you doing with this? Well, if we shut off the heat, we could turn the fellowship room into a small ice skating rink. I mean, that was my joy. That was my joke of coping. And it could have been. Yes, every day was squishy in the carpets. But we were still able to function and do what needed to be done. I don't know about you, but that was all worth joyous celebration in my eyes. There is a story that is from the Desert Fathers, one about Abbot John, known as the Dwarf. Abbot John prayed to the Lord that all passion be taken from him, because in his passion he recognized that's where temptation would lie. And his prayer was granted. He became impassable, untemptable, uncorruptible. In this condition, he went to one of the elders and said, You see before you a man who is completely at rest and has no more temptations. Expecting the elder to say, Good! The elder surprised him, and instead of praising him, said, Go and pray to the Lord to command some struggle to be stirred up within you. For the soul is only matured when battles arise. Abbot John did this. And when the temptation started again, he did not pray that the struggle be taken away. Instead, he prayed, Lord, give me the strength to get through this fight. He didn't whine. He didn't lament. He didn't pine about how it was before this or why did this have to happen to me. Instead, he took his struggle and he put it before God, saying, God, help me. God, be with me. God, fill me. 
I think in Jesus' time in the wilderness, he was pretty much doing the same thing. Temptation seems only to, tr- only to be a trap that leads to difficulties and even, designate, even devastating tra- tragedy when there is truly another side of temptation. If we pay attention, in other words, if we don't get caught up in the anxiety of it all, if we pay attention, temptation presents us with the opportunity to learn about ourselves as we imagine the consequences of yielding to temptation. We can mentally work through the consequences without having to live through them. The benefits is obvious. If we act on the temptation, do we create negative consequences for ourselves and for others? Most of the time. What we learn from Jesus in all of this is that we meet and walk through the challenges of the wilderness with the clarity, with being honest with ourselves by the temptations and the attacks that come at us, by meeting God daily when it is convenient and when it is inconvenient. Jesus, the Son of God, was ready to meet these challenges in the wilderness because he met daily with his Father, communed with him, learned what it meant to be not merely his anointed Son, but also what it meant to walk with him each and every day. Jesus got through the time of the wilderness not because he was God's Son, because he was because he was thoroughly versed in all the teachings of the writings, the prophets, the law, and what it meant to have a godly life. Do this and God will bless you. But he came out with a different set of convictions. Not merely academic and without emotion and engagement, but those in which you let God truly come in and permeate and guide your heart. He held to these understandings and applications of the law of them from a personal, emotional level, not merely going through the motions. And he learned personally in that wilderness experience that his father, who had sent him to the earth, would never, ever, ever abandon him. Never let him down. How many times have we been let down by a person we put trust in? An employer, an organization, said, hey, we'll do this for you. Then you find out when you read the fine print, no, no, they really won't. There is no fine print with God. There is no exit clause where they don't have to act on something. God will do what God says he will do. And Jesus learned that in the wilderness. And when we allow ourselves to meet God daily before the wilderness time comes our way, then we are prepared for the challenges of the wilderness. And if it's bigger than our preparation, God will still be there presenting himself as to who he is, what his love can do for us, and how we can live a life that is worth... If I had one vain wish, it would be to travel back in time and found the person that started teaching this idea that once you say yes to Jesus, everything gets easy. Because in my not-so-holy moment, I would take my left shoe off and batter them with it. Because what Paul teaches us is that the closer to God we grow, the more of a broken wretch that we see that we are. And in that revelation, we see how much more we need him. Really goes against the grain of, if you say yes to Jesus, everything will be okay. We will struggle. We will be tempted. Jesus was, why shouldn't we? But our Heavenly Father stayed loyal to His Son. And through His Son, we have been given the promise that He will stay with us. Sometimes showing us the way. Sometimes pushing us through the door. 
sometimes holding us back, sometimes saying, I want you to sit and do nothing, just let the wind pass. The challenge that we have is having our relationship with God strong enough, connected with enough, be honest enough to be able to recognize what God is saying to us in that given moment. What God is providing to us in the real need of the situation, not what we perceive. Then we can celebrate. Then we can share then we can know and walk with confidence that our God is truly with us. As you go from this place, as you continue to journey through this Lenten season, take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. And if the Spirit calls you to apply some of it to your lives, but as you all go from this place, do not be afraid to let the world know you all are people of God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.